everyone needs to build an audience. It doesn't matter what you're doing. And um, you're not going to build a very wide audience if you don't make people feel things. And, um, you know, good or bad. We see people successful making people feel bad and <laughs> other people are very successful making people feel good or in awe of their talent or, or whatever it might be. But you have to engage in a way that make people feel something. And that's really what the human condition is about, you know, make me love or make me hate or make me, it's, it's not a lot of movement happening out of ambival ambivalence, you know, <laughs> out of being neutral. Um, there's a lot of momentum around uh, extremes of emotion. So we want to make people feel uh, something towards uh, an end goal. From cave drawings to family histories to stories around the fire, humans crave order among chaos, connection amid isolation. So we tell stories. Our mission at the Storytellers Network is to bring the art of story to the masses. Whether you're in marketing, you're an entrepreneur, or you're developing your own personal brand, telling your story effectively can make the difference between celebrating milestones and collecting unemployment. The Storytellers Network strives to help storytellers tell their stories so you can learn from the best. Now, your host, the inbound evangelist himself, Dan Moyle. Hello and welcome to the Storytellers Network podcast. I'm your host, Dan Moyle, and I am a believer in the power of story. From personal connections to business networking, storytelling connects us, and it's what separates us from all other life on this planet. And we're about to dive into yet another great story with a fantastic storyteller and a, uh, a great person who spent just a little bit of time with me and I'm very grateful for it. And before we do that, a quick reminder that our website has great resources available, past episodes and contact information for me. Visit thestorytellersnetwork.com for that. And if you're new and just testing the waters, uh, text storytellers to 31996 to get a text back to subscribe to the Storytellers Network podcast. Today's guest is Brian Kelly. Now, Brian is a photographer and filmmaker, and he does commercials and portraits, all kinds of great stuff. He's out of Grand Rapids, Michigan, who travels frequently, as he puts it, to wherever he needs to be. Uh, Seth Meyers, Whoopi Goldberg, Betty White, uh, Amy Schumer, Eminem, all part of his portfolio for portraits, which has been fun to watch that over the last few years. His passion is to shoot and communicate stories. Now, a seasoned photographer and director, he has more than 20 years of experience on productions all over the country. And we'll talk a little bit about where that career has taken him. Uh, hybrid shoots are his specialty, where he and his team actually create amazing video and print assets during the same production. And we get into that as well, and I figure out how that all works. Uh, this visual storyteller, took time to explore the craft of storytelling. So without further ado, let's get to Brian's stories. So Brian, thanks for taking time to, uh, to join the Storytellers Network podcast. Appreciate you talking to the audience, man. It's my pleasure. I'm glad you reached out and, uh, and I'm looking forward to our chat. So this yeah. will be good. And I've been following you for a while. We, and I, and I was thinking about it tonight before talking to you. I don't, remember exactly where it happened. It might've been laugh fest or something to do with grand rapids, something art prize. Uh, but I've been following you for a while and I see you as a storyteller through your photography, through your films, that kind of stuff. Do you consider yourself a storyteller? Absolutely. Yeah. I think, uh, portraiture and photography is communicating some level of story and, and, uh, sometimes, you're telling a story in a single frame, like in a photograph and other times as a video producer and director, you know, you're telling them at uh, 24 frames a second, you know, it's just depends on, on the approach and what the project is. But absolutely. I think of photography, especially with my work the last few years has been a lot of portraiture and just trying to describe a, a person or, or my impression of a person. And one of the unique aspects of a lot of the work that I do is that I do a lot of environmental portraiture. And that just means that I'm shooting on your location. I might be, uh, you know, if it's a business, I, I'm taking portraits of people, um, where they do the work, you know, so I'm sort of describing who they are, what they do and where they do it. And, uh, 
and help interpret those stories for their brands and for their companies, you know? And, and you mentioned just in, in that, in that answer, photography and film, uh, in the intro, I talk a little bit about how you do stills and motion. How do you decide which to use when, or do you try and always use both or what's your, your storytelling preference there? Well, I, I started as a photographer and really I've been in business now about 20 years, a little over 20 years. And, you know, when I started in photography, it was pre-digital and there wasn't really the internet as we know it now. There was, you know, some AOL stuff going on and just some <laughs> low bandwidth. And uh, you, couldn't, you couldn't really use the platform like we all understand it today to tell video stories. But... Um, with the progression of digital and the last eight, 10 years, I've been shooting a lot of video projects and that arose out of relationships that I had with clients. I got started in video just because, um, you know, you could tell stories online. We had uh, cameras that had changed and became hybrid cameras that could do stills and motion in the same camera body. So I got very intrigued with that right away just to adapt to that new technology. Around the same time, bandwidth was emerging, YouTube was becoming a big deal. And so I uh, would leverage uh, relationships that I have with clients and encourage them to start to try video, even though I didn't have a lot of experience in storytelling in a video format or motion format. But today, everything now, I try to shoot some video components for clients if they'll allow us to do it and they can wrangle out uh, you know, it depends on their budget concerns and some other things. But I think today we need, we need stills and really great photography that hasn't really changed. What's uh, has changed is the industry approach to that is which I'm um, very much involved in is, is to try take a hybrid approach to doing productions and that's to do all your photography assets, but also at the same time or alongside that production, you're also creating video or vice versa. Sometimes I get, asked to do a video production and then I'm like, Hey, what kind of stills could we get out of this? That'll be assets to you down the road. And the emergence of needing image libraries, video libraries, messaging libraries has become a huge industry uh, concern in, in photography and video. Um, so, you know, we're always, and now imagery and messages and podcasts and everything gets consumed so quickly. So we all have to churn out, we all have these animals to be fed online. You know, you have all your social platforms and, and you need to really generate a lot of content. So content creation is a thing and I'm trying to be mindful with all my clients to try to leverage uh, as much out of one production as we can so they get as much return on their investment and they're able to, to use assets, not just next week or next month or, but you know, maybe a year or two worth of things out of one production. Sure. That's, that's pretty wise. It's, got to be good business, I would guess. Um, I mean, like good karma for business, you know. Um, when you say get a, get a lot out of one shoot, are you able to get still, like maybe this is a kind of technical, maybe a silly question. Can you get stills out of video or do you bring both cameras? Do you switch back and forth? How does that work? I think it's the best results are when you can use both camera formats, you know, mm -hmm. and a lot of our production approach is typically video takes, so if we're going to shoot for a particular company in one day, we'll shoot the video assets uh, first. And those are generally a little more time consuming. They, they need more gear and lighting and some crew involved. But once we're set up, it's pretty easy and efficient uh, with, with experience to, to flip over to the photography side and take much less time and sort of duplicate some of those scenes for stills. You can technically screen grab now with 4K and 8K cameras, you can. Um, I'm going to shut that off. Sorry about that. <laughs> but the, um, uh, you're able to, you're te of course, technically uh, capable, but it depends on the frame rate that the video is shooting, whether it's blurred or is there motion across the screen that might not arrest that, uh, you know, it might be slightly blurry or have some motion blur. So, um, yes, technical, uh, technically very, very possible, but it, there's a lot of contingencies to whether that's a good approach or not. So, so generally you should be able to 
plan for both formats rather than, oh, just grab some video and we'll, we'll find something. Like you really should plan to tell a quality story by using both formats. Preparation right? is key. And um, that's where uh, it, the challenge is today from a customer or client standpoint is to try to pull them back from the run and gun sort of um, approach to things and really take some time and some a little more up just a little bit more of upfront investment and man hours and time and really plan out the approach uh, basic loose storyboards um, maybe it's a loose script that we're working with of some kind, or at least have a sh an established shot list well before we get to arrive to shoot things. So we have a plan and are able to, again, execute and uh, adapt even um, quickly on site, determine what's important, what's not important, even in the act of shooting. So, um, yeah, it's, it, it's the, always, it's better to have more of a, a, a concerned uh, a more comprehensive approach to a production um, but I respond to clients you know there's some clients that are very much more methodical and they're more comfortable with a more thought out process and they like to meet about things and then you have other clients who are like hey you're the photographer or video guy let's uh, let's run around and, and get some stuff you know I can do both but um, you know typically the best results are when you really think about the audience that that company has, who are they trying to engage with? What are their brand platforms? You know, what are their color schemes and their logos or on their webpage or on their print components? Like there's a million things to think about. But um, if we think about those things ahead of time, we'll have much better results and, and consistent results, uh, you know, with each interaction we have with clients, each project to project. And it sounds like you can, kind of switch between the artist and the business mentality it does that does that cross over naturally for you or did you have to work at that it's work like i i'm not a lot of the business acumen i have really came out of a diy sort of approach you know it's um when you're small you start small and you have to do a lot of things about that one is to be um making sure that you're charging enough and business oriented enough to stay um, to stay profitable enough to do it, keep doing it. Mm -hmm. So um, there's that. And then I, I would couple that with, um, you know, my dad was an airline pilot and kind of against all odds, he, he flew jet fighters in, in the Marines. And I say it's against all odds because he wasn't necessarily a great student. He wasn't a template fighter pilot to go into the Marine Corps and be successful flying jets and he really kind of struggled at some of the testing and the math skills to go into that but he didn't let that stop him so in terms of how that rubbed off on me it was like I wasn't gonna once I knew what my dream was and what I wanted to pursue I had watched my dad not let uh, jump over hurdle after hurdle to become a, you know a career-long aviation pilot had a long career and and loved what he did every single day so I bring that with me more than maybe like an actual, I'm a business guy and I have a, a great um, business model or plan. I just think I have some of that entrepreneurial spirit to figure th some things out. Mm -hmm. But um, at the same time, um, I'm trying to align that with as much of my artistic intention and background that I have uh, in intentionally in, in crafting stories uh, for a variety of a lot of different clients and, and the every day is different. And I love that. So, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's adapting, but I would say I feel more entrepreneurial than like a super business guy. <laughs> sure. Sure. I mean, cause it, I feel like it's kind of the, the typical, uh, perception is a starving artist, right? Oh, you're a photographer. Well, you must be poor. And in reality it's, it's artist and business entrepreneur is a great way to put it. Um, cause entrepreneurs are creative. I feel like anyway, um, that's really cool. I, yeah. I want to go back. I want to go back to what you said about when you're talking about your dad. You said um, you you wanted to bring that when you when you knew what you were going to do. We knew what your dream was. Is where does that story for you begin? Did you know at an early age you wanted to be a photographer or a storyteller, or what did you kind of decide on back then? And when was that? Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. I I had an early interest in photography as a kid. It wasn't anything you could leverage. I was eight or ten years old one of my uncles uh, lived out of state and he owned a camera shop and 
kind of a development dark room and, and a kind of a frame store um, in Georgia. And it wasn't an uncle I knew very well necessarily. He was a nice guy and somebody in my family, but I didn't have an opportunity to spend a lot of time with him. But he sent me a camera and that ignited some interest um, early on. But I really came to photography in my mid 20s. I had been at a traditional college age, I had been, by all intents and purposes, a failure. I had gone off to um, I had started college and didn't really know what I wanted to do. And that just led to not doing very well in college, some frustration. And I, I dabbled in college for about, you know, two, two and a half years. And then I, I just left and started working in a field that was completely unrelated to photography. And I worked in that field for four or five years and then decided I didn't want to do that anymore. And I um, didn't want to have a retail type of career my whole life. And I went back to school at, at the age of 24, 25 years old and um, discovered photography at that point as something that might be viable for my future. And um, had some very good instructors early on at a community college in Grand Rapids. And they really encouraged me to continue. Um, you know, they saw something in me that I didn't quite see, but encouraged me enough to, to keep plowing it forward. And um, I think, you know, the starving artist thing is definitely something that um, I, I think it's put on artists a lot, but I think it's entrepreneurs too. You know, any kind of small business owner or somebody starting out on their own, you don't start out rich, you know, in the first month or two, or um, there's a lot of failure and success or, you know, a lot of failures, a lot of frustrations, a lot of getting through the, the uncertainty of just doing your own thing. And certainly artists are, are part of that and, and have, but I look at it as more like a parallel. It isn't necessarily, um, it, everything we're doing is difficult. You know, I mean, if you're going to sell real estate, that's difficult. If you're going to be a banker or own a gas station, I mean, there aren't easy businesses to get into. No. If they were easy and we could all just make lots of money doing easy things, that's what we'd all be doing. And so um, I think aligning what you love to do, knowing that life is going to be difficult, entrepreneurship and business is going to be diff difficult, at least align a passion. So it gets you through, those things and sometimes for artists that's their art and what they create and musicians it's their music and it's for uh, real estate people or marketing people it's the drive to um continue to stay engaged in their passion so yeah that, that's incredible i, I got distracted because you said marketing people and i thought no those marketing people are terrible because that's what i do um anyway <laughs> but yeah i mean i think that's that's a great way to put it though um so you, you mentioned your uncle in the, in the dark room. Do you have uh, any kind of a nostalgic pull towards dark rooms versus digital or like, what is that like nowadays for someone like yourself, Ryan? Yeah, I, I haven't, I haven't been in a dark room in probably, uh, let's see, 2000, probably 12 or 13 years. I haven't been in a dark room, but I, for, I spent my first from 95 to 2005 immersed in the dark room. Yeah. So I love that background. I think that's, that's something that's really needed and missing in a lot of um, photography training these days. You don't have to go in and print negatives and really um, the craft of making something beautiful in the dark room is, is uh, you know, there's some retro, you know, kind of um, fans and the enthusiasts of older photography processes, but it isn't really commercially viable. So when digital really became a thing and, and we didn't need film anymore, I was happy to leap to that. It wasn't long after that, that video started getting tacked onto these camera bodies and it was like, here's a whole new set of tools to play with. And so um, I'm happy to process images in Lightroom and Photoshop and, mm. and really express my vision on a particular project through those tools versus having to go into a, a wet dark room. Okay. So it is, so it's a good growth thing than not like, Oh, it's all been ruined. <laughs> well, the world changes every, you know, now it's turning over all the time. I mean, right. technology is trumping itself as it hits the market. So um, you have to adapt and you have to respond to the marketplace and what clients are needing to push, push everything forward. I, I started more in a fine art career um, shooting cityscapes and black and white work and trying to sell that as truly an artist and a gallery owner. But, you know, the last 
10, 15 years, I've been very commercially oriented, advertising and, co and corporately oriented, um, but have brought that art of hopefully storytelling and some of the things that I do that, that I can potentially bring that are unique to the table for my clients uh, in an artistic way. And I think the last eight, 10 years has been a really good time period for me because I get asked to do things uh, in a way that they want, they see some art or some artistic approach that I have to portraiture or corporate projects, and they want that brought to it versus me adapting to a template of a visual style that you know is easy to replicate or is uh, widely already used. So I feel like I'm being, even though it might be a corporate or an advertising job, I do feel really lucky that many times they feel like commissions to do my own work and my own style of portraiture that I love to do. So you get a little create, creative autonomy within, within barriers yeah. then. That's cool. Certainly so, not, I'm not all the time on every project and I'm a team sure. player. So I'm, I'm happy to adapt and dial up or down how much art direction I can physically and, and inject into a project. Sometimes I might be just reacting to um, some comps that we call them, you know, they're sort of, um, there are sort of go buys and mood sheets are called mood boards that, that the client will send that have a feel for what the photography should look like and how people might be interacting within a photograph to help tell those stories. But, and I'm happy to just play ball and do those types of things. And other times clients say, Hey, we really want your twist on this. And then I'll um, still ask a lot of questions and, and, talk, a, ask a lot about that particular project and who the audience is and how are we shaping messages. And I'm really trying to use my experience and being in 20 years to really think hopefully a little bit more like, not just as a photographer who can click some photos and deliver some files, but really have an understanding of their brand and what their challenges are as a business and how maybe storytelling and videography and photography could help um, propel them forward in some way. Um, in an effective way that you know maybe isn't quite as effective anymore and they want to have something new or a new approach or something fresher yeah so so listening is an important part of that storytelling world and that component then huh a lot more listening than talking yeah. <laughs> you know i mean i'm more interested <laughs> in what you have to say than what is coming out of my mouth because i'm i'm internally ingesting and really um thinking about a lot of things and yeah. um and I think even when I'm interviewing somebody who might have had a, uh, a crisis in their life through, uh, I do a lot with pharmaceutical companies or healthcare companies. And so we do what we call branded testimonials with um, patients. Mm -hmm. And so they're really telling their real life story and how they interacted with a particular company or a brand, or even could be a drug that saved their life or mm -hmm. extended their life or reduced their symptoms of some kind. Like I'm just, I'm listening and I'm helping to shepherd out uh, stories in a way um, that can um, work well on a video platform. And that's really what I'm doing is I'm listening and interpreting and helping to guide these stories out of, out of people, especially uh, I'm expressly talking about a video project, you know, or video approach to things that that in mm -hmm. this little part, but um, yeah, a lot more listening and adapting and thinking and then coming up with a plan later. Yeah. And it sounds like you haven't had to give up your passion or set aside your passion and, and like, Oh, I got to take a corporate client in order to, you know, fund my hobby later. Like you're, it sounds like Brian, you're able to bring the two together. And, and, and again, maybe not every time you have complete autonomy, but you're able to still love what you do. So, I mean, for storytellers out there, for photographers in particular, there is hope for that, isn't there? Yeah, that's the win. The win-win is is being able to enjoy what you're doing. I think you have to have an interest in people and really have compassion and empathy, whether it's a corporation, an advertising agency, or it doesn't matter who I'm engaged with, but I'm I'm really rooting for them. I'm I have a lot of empathy for what they're trying to do and admiration in many times. So like I'm so honored to be asked and invited to be part of particular types of projects that um, it, it really is an honor. And, and 
within that context and as a business person, I'm interested in, in doing work, not just one time or one project for them, but like I've had clients that I've had from the very start of my career that I, maybe I don't work with them every single year, but they're people that I've engaged with for 20, 21 years, sometimes a lot within a short time period. And then, you know, they're fine for a while and they come back. So I'm interested in long-term relationships and, and people you work with in this setting as a photographer and a video director and telling stories. It's, it's a, it's an honor to interpret those stories. And it's also, um, you become friends and, um, as long as you're delivering a good product and you're good on your word and you do what you say you're going to do and try to meet your clients' expectations, it really lays the roadmap to really having some longer relationships. And where I'm at in West Michigan, that's, that's everything. You can't, you can't burn bridges around here. You're not going to fool anybody. You have to be a, you have to be a good, a, a, a good business person who's going to be honest in everything that they're going to do from the time you estimate something to the time you deliver it and hopefully stay within the parameters of those projects and, and execute things at a really high level for your clients. That's a small world word gets around. So who is your favorite client? But no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Which <is fine>. um, <laughs> do you, but do you have like over the years, do you have favorite maybe projects that have come up like, Oh man, I can't believe I got to do that. Yeah. Um, I just wrapped one. I think when we first started talking, I was down in Phoenix and I was working or we were trying to line up some stuff and I was pretty, uh, I was dark for about 10 days and I was on a really intense project for a golf equipment manufacturer in Scottsdale, Arizona. And, and they um, have, I don't know, 15 or 16 PGA tour players. Some of them, the best, some of the best known golfers in the golf world uh, play their clubs. And so we was working on a, several different commercials for them on a soundstage down in Scottsdale, Arizona. And, you know, I'm working with, um, you know, Zach Johnson, who's won the masters and he's won the uh, British open. And, you know, he's, <laughs> you know, I, that's a pinch me moment where I can't believe I'm a guy from Grand Rapids who's uh, being asked to direct all these world-class athletes and, um, so anyway, yeah, that, that was a recent one. I, I really love a lot of the healthcare industry stories that we're telling because I'm not just writing a script and casting actors, um, uh, you know, or I'm not I'm directing a script. These are real people's stories and they've had real crises and they've overcome things and they're inspirational. And I'm really trying to uh, tell their stories on that level and how can that in turn inspire other people you know, in a sense, in a, to benefit that company that they've had a great uh, experience with and project that story out into the world in the hopes that more people might um, have a similar result um, in their healthcare, or whatever their crisis was or where the outcome was. But, um, you know, the, I, I do truly, it's, I do, I don't want to sound too sappy or too, you know, Jim neighbors, oh, golly gee, but like it's, it's a, uh, I feel really lucky after 20 years to be doing this. I, I still feel really, really engaged with every project. I don't care if it's a big project or a small project, just over a few hours. I, I, every engagement is truly um, a new experience and a new opportunity to um, explore what I do and, and how people, uh, I don't know, how, what way do I want to put it? How people are living their lives, you know, and how we can amplify those stories to uh, whatever audience is out there. Amplify their stories. That's a good one. Being a steward of stories, I, I think is. That's a great word. Yeah, you're really, yeah, and that's what I feel about it really being an honor is that you are given a lot of trust as a photographer. I hear I'm, I'm a, you're entrusting me with how you look and how you're presenting yourself out to the world. So um, there's some vulnerability there that, that the best portrait sessions have. There's at some point, there's this exchange of um, um, them really putting their trust in your hands, whether it be photography or video, but there's a moment in that storytelling and the capturing of those images and stories that, you know, is uh, people are vulnerable and I'm, and I'm incredibly grateful that they can open 
of themselves up to enough that we can get a powerful enough story and, and allow me in just enough to, to really um, hopefully have a powerful outcome. And, and so it's, it sounds to me like portrait photography is, and, and I'm going to, this is maybe might be a softball question, but I'm going to ask it. <laughs> it's more than just, Hey, sit down and have a picture. We're done. Like, it sounds like you're actually truly connecting with people then, right? Yeah. I mean, early on I was, I was uh, not necessarily a great portraitist. I, I wasn't technically very um, adept yet at what I was doing. And I was many times in a particular portrait session, whether I was on location in a factory or I was in a studio setting or, whatever wherever i was photographing that where wherever i was photographing that person i was much more concerned about my lighting and technically if things were going on and not really interacting with the subject and as i got more comfortable around just the technology and and my lighting and how my lighting skills have progressed as an artist and confident in, in those skills and knowing what i need technically then I don't need to worry about that anymore. Then it becomes a one-on-one -on -one interaction and then I'm really guiding them through the, either the portrait sitting or directing their story through the video process. But it comes down to um, being able to shed your worries and all those voices in the back of your head, whether you're doing you know, the right things technically. That's not a great way to start a photo shoot if you're worried if your light's in the right spot or what power levels you have on them light hitting the back of their head and and here they are trying to give you something on camera and your mind isn't there so i think the biggest growth area for me in the last you know especially five ten years has been um settling into the session and that exchange between um photographer and the subject and really talking with them while we're shooting and and just kind of creating something out of that exchange and every exchange is different in every person's approach. I shoot a lot of um, real people on top. I've done a lot of celebrity stuff too, but I've, I've a lot of real people, they haven't been around a big photo set or a you know, photo shoot and they're nervous and they're very self-conscious. And so I have to, you know, as you said, sort of shepherd and sort of create a connection and some rapport. I think that's another key word is creating a rapport with somebody early on is, is a key to get them focused on you and not what's happening around them with lights and crew and assistants and maybe a makeup artist or something. And that happens even at a celebrity level. I'm trying to crack through um, in a very short period of time. I might only have three to five minutes with certain people, but um establishing a, a rapport as quickly as possible to kind of get through, crack through that veneer that they might put on just for getting their picture taken. And they're not going to give you a whole lot more just because they're at, you aren't, you don't have much of a rapport with them yet. Yeah. How, how did, so speaking of celebrities, you know, I, I've been watching your career. I don't, I'm sure Facebook will tell us at some point how long we've been friends there, but it's, you know, four or five years or whatever that I've been watching and I've seen the progression, which has been amazing celebrity and real and everything that you're doing. So, so kudos as a fan. Um, but also just watching your career as like a maturity level by celebrity status, maybe, right? Like how did you get to this point where you're having photography shoots with guys like Seth Meyers or, you know, major comedians with laugh fest, or you worked with Eminem and his crew, right? Recently, like a few months yeah, ago, uh, about a year ago, it was about a year, about a year ago. ago now. Um, has it been a year yeah. already? Wow. <laughs> yeah. It Time was, flies. Uh, so how does, yeah. So how does that kind of get to that point for you, Brian? Well, it takes a lifetime to get there. Like it's kind of like uh, it's, it all seems to happen at once, but the 20 years you put in in front, it, nothing would have happened without that in front of it. So it takes a moment and, and uh, some luck and some things, but you were doing the work for, for 20 years ahead of that. <laughs> um, Laugh Fest has been, an amazing you know for a guy from grand rapids and west michigan to be the official festival photographer since the, the day it was announced before the first comedians even came to town i was fortunate enough to be invited to be the photographer to to my job for laugh fest which is a 10-day comedy festival uh, in grand rapids michigan and they bring in some major major comics and entertainers um, my job from, from day one has been to 
they commissioned me to shoot a, a unique portrait of every one of those talented people that come to Grand Rapids. And that is an opportunity that it does not happen to many photographers in the Midwest uh, or anywhere in the country, really. Um, it's a rare opportunity. So Laugh has really um, entrusted me to, to do the right thing with the celebrities and to conduct ourselves quickly and efficiently. Um, I have uh, two to three assistants on every shoot, so we get lit properly. We do a lot of preparation ahead of time so that when the comedian comes in like a Seth Meyers or Whoopi Goldberg or, you know, Betty White or gosh, there's been so many Pete Holmes and Mark Marin and I'm forgetting so many, but like it's um, that we're ready and they just know we explain, I explain how the lighting is set up and where they are and they're all pros. They're, they're in, you know, they know what a photo shoot looks like and, and, uh, but we can get through those things really efficiently and they have a good experience, even though they're doing something they're kind of technically obligated to do for the festival. And many times that establishes a relationship that's long-term and I do some things outside of Laugh Fest with some of the same comics that, you know, came to Grand Rapids, didn't expect a great photo shoot and uh, were able to work again down the road just because, you know, in five minutes I came up with some nice portraits of them and, um, and just tried to keep it a great experience. Laugh Fest is an organization that benefits Gilda's Club um, of Grand Rapids, which is named after Gilda Radner, the Saturday Night Live, you know, star. She died of cancer, established this Gilda's Clubs, which are cancer support centers. And um, so with the legacy of SNL and, and Gilda Radner, um, they might be a little more amenable to, to doing something a little bit extra for us uh, because they loved Gilda they appreciate her comic genius and her legacy. And also, you know, it is for charity and their, um, the proceeds go to support an amazing cancer support center. So Laugh Fest, you know, that really, it's a chicken or egg thing. So to get back to your question, how do you progress? You know, you're not often given high profile people to shoot until they've seen high profile people on your website. So it's, how do you get started? Well, I don't, you know, it's a hard question, but I was certainly given a huge in uh, with Laugh Fest because I can shoot eight to 15 high profile people every single year. <clears throat> and that's led to work. Uh, my first high profile shoot was with Jeff Daniels though, that wasn't involved with uh, Laugh Fest that came through a magazine assignment mm. uh, for a guitar magazine because he's a folk guitarist and singer as well as one of the world's greatest actors. And he's from Michigan and um, still lives in Chelsea down by Ann Arbor. So mm -hmm. one of the biggest first shoots I got was with uh, Jeff Daniels. And once I had him in my portfolio, then it seemed to, you know, well, if you shot him, you could shoot somebody else. And, you know, people see it from the outside. So it's a snowball effect. And it is kind of a chicken or egg. You know, there's many people capable of shooting high profile people. Um, but if I, if those people that handle them don't see a lot of how high profile people on, on your website, they're not probably, they're probably going to pass on you. Yeah. So again, fortunate to have the client base that I have with laugh fest and, um, but I've taken those opportunities and really, you know, I've honored each and every photo shoot and given it, 1000% of my effort, whether it was somebody fairly unknown. I mean, a Amy Schumer was fairly unknown when I shot her for Laugh Fest and now she's a global megastar. And, um, you know, I didn't treat her any different than Whoopi Goldberg. And actually that year I shot Whoopi Goldberg first and then Amy Schumer a day or two later. And, um, you know, now you would argue their fame is maybe equal, you know, in terms of globally or depends on the demographic, but still, um, you know, uh, you never know what time is going to do. And again, you, um, want to make the most of every opportunity you're given. Make most of every opportunity you're given work ethic, right? Empathy connections, man. That's great. That's great. Empathy, empathy is huge with me. And I, I maybe it's cause I'm older. I, I said I turned 50, but like empathy is really a, a thing that like, it just doesn't pay to be arrogant. It doesn't, it doesn't serve anybody to be prickly and difficult. 
as long as I feel like I'm being respected in my process, then you're not going to, we're going to, it's never really going to be a, an issue. We're going to have a great shoot. I'm not afraid to stand up for myself for what I want. And I've certainly had experiences with certain entertainers or comics and many times it may or may not be part of laugh fest but where you really just feel pushed around and kind of disrespected but you know that's a point where i'm i'm a professional and i'm here to do a job and you're here to do a job as well so let's you know let's figure out a way to make a great photograph for two minutes you know you got to give me two minutes <laughs> <laughs> just get it done um <laughs> And, and I, and I see in the photography, the, the portraits that you do, I mean, I feel like I see a story there. Maybe it's me just filling in the story, but how do you capture a story in a frame? I think you said that earlier in the conversation too, about capturing a story in the frame. How, like, how do you do that, man? Is that just a God given talent? Well, yeah, I developed early on. A, uh, I, it's rooted in my background in architectural photography, I think, and why I've mentioned environmental portraits earlier is because that is telling a story of where every component in the photograph matters. It's all telling a story. Everything behind you, I see behind you, there's a, there's a guitar and is that a bass guitar? Yeah, or, it is. Yep. Okay. So I'm a really, I would love to, I was even telling my daughter, I would love to get a bass. I, I can't, I'm not, I can't even read music, but I would love to play the bass guitar. <laughs> and so we have that kinship, but like, you know, there's a story behind you right now. There's photographs and there's the objects that you've intentionally put in your house. And I see a, a Jack Johnson poster. And so I know a little bit about you just like that, just from the screen from our Skype, you know, and it's yeah. like, um, I take that approach to shooting a factory worker on location or a CEO at a top company. Um, every little part that you see in a photograph is intentional. There aren't many accidents in my photograph. It, what I'm including is just as important as what I'm excluding mm -hmm. because um, how you reduce around people, you're, you're, you're still by reduction, you're still amplifying other things by taking things away. You're putting more emphasis on something else. So it's a, it's a dance, but I, I started in architectural photography was really where I got my first commercial um, success working with companies would be um, describing newly finished buildings for architects and general contractors and interior designers interpreting design. So everything in the frame matters as far as how you um, craft a photograph. So early on when I wasn't so comfortable with portraiture, I was still really comfortable with spaces around people. I was comfortable with space and architecture and rooms. So one approach I had early on, which I don't use quite as much, although I, it is kind of a nice crutch for me to fall back on is sometimes I think about what, if no one was in this photograph right now, no person was in it, would it still be an interesting photo without a person? And if the answer is yes, then I, then it's easy to just insert that person into the photograph and then light them really nicely. And then I have the best of kind of both worlds. Hmm. So it was just a way to kind of think about how to include things. And, and that all builds to what your question was, which is how do you tell a story in a single frame? And, and I do that with lighting too. And that, that's evolved. And I'm uh, over time, I've sort of reduced background elements and really just focused on how I'm going to light a person. And I think of a person sometimes not always on it when I'm lighting them, technically when I'm thinking about how do I want light to fall upon a person's head or face or the one side of their face versus the other, I'm thinking of them more like an object than Seth mm. Meyers or, um, you know, uh, yeah. Anderson Cooper or somebody like that. I'm, I'm really thinking about how, how I can shape and, light fall on that person and that point it doesn't matter who it is it could be the queen of england or it could be um you know uh, a barber in detroit you know I, i'm really interested in both of those people equally and and whether the, the queen or a barber they've got stories so yeah just to clarify just, i have awesome. not photographed the queen of england <laughs> i have photographed barbers in detroit but right. uh, the Queen of England is still on the bucket list, but I right. doubt the, the call will be coming anytime soon. <laughs> I'll send a tweet later and see if I can get you a phone call. No. Um, <laughs> so speaking of, so sending a tweet, I made, made a joke there, but uh, well, at least attempted to. But um, how do you think things like Twitter, the social media world, 
has affected this whole storytelling and photography world for you or just in general, maybe it's accelerated the need to tell stories. Mm -hmm. Um, for one, every person, whether you're an individual has these platforms to feed, you know, whether you're on LinkedIn or Facebook or Instagram or Twitter or Snapchat or whatever next platform is coming next. Um, I remember the conversation around this, the slow pace that a lot of corporations took to get on Facebook and do Facebook business pages and yeah. to get on Twitter. They're like, what do we need to do this for? Like, what is Instagram? Like, why are we doing this? And what it has amplified is the individual story. Like everyone, even my daughters who are 19 and 17, they're very intentional about what they're sharing with the world, what it says about them they're crafting and art directing, you know, at least the, the superficialness of their lives online. So it, it got people thinking in a, in a photographic way, maybe a video narrative way, which has never in human history happened before. So it's really interesting time to be in this field. It's a challenging time because everybody's a photographer now. Everybody's a videographer. Um, it's hard to discern value and, rates and things when everybody can supposedly do what everyone else can do. So, you know, technology is democratized access to good photography, good videography. It's easier now than ever, but the challenges, um, I think still remain the same and that's how do you touch and engage people? And that's through stories and that's through making me feel empathy for you or for your cause or your plight, or how do you drive me to action? You know, uh, how do you drive an audience to action? And, and that's through stories and that's through visual stories now more than ever with every single one of these platforms. It's a great time to be a photographer. It isn't the most lucrative time, but it's a great time to be engaged in something and continuing to build expertise around how do you solve these problems about engagement? And that's what every company and every person, whether you're a realtor, I keep picking on realtors. I don't know why. I love <laughs> realtors. I have a lot of friends who are realtors, but they're fun you know, to pick on though too. Yeah, it's all right. <laughs> sure. So we're marketing people, and I'm a marketing guy. So yeah, absolutely, <laughs> there's a lot of uh, truth to cliches. But you know, it doesn't matter. Everyone's uh, everyone needs to build an audience. It doesn't matter what you're doing, and um, you're not going to build a very wide audience if you don't make people feel things. And um, you know, good or bad. We see people successful making people feel bad and other people are very successful making people feel good or in awe of their talent or, or whatever it might be. But you have to engage in a way that make people feel something. And that's really what the human condition is about, you know, make me love or make me hate or make me, you know, there's not a lot of movement happening out of ambival ambivalence, you know, <laughs> out of being neutral. Um, there's a lot of momentum around uh, extremes of emotion. So we want to make people feel uh, something towards uh, an end goal. And it's funny that you, you said earlier, just a, a second ago about everybody has it a phone and Instagram, everybody has a camera. Cause that was one of my notes at the beginning of all of this. I wrote down early on. So for me, on my notes down here, nobody else it's full circle, but, uh, but with Instagram and phones that now have more megapixels than my first digital camera, you, you know, you said it, everybody's a photographer now, but I mean, so in one hand, it's really cool to see people's life through their own viewfinder, so to speak. But how does a storyteller, how does a photographer, set themselves apart. I mean, you said empathy, get me to care, but how else can you set yourself apart as a, maybe a young photographer? What would you give that person for advice? Well, a young person coming up, I would say, keep, keep shooting, keep shooting a ton. You have to create content, but more than just your phone. Like if you really want to be a, a photographer with a, a longer career and be able to have more than just cool moments on your phone, um, do your best to keep elevating your technical skills because I work really hard with lighting and a lot of my lighting styles are complicated. You know, it requires, a, you can't get from, you know, the, from end zone to end zone in, in a year, you know, I slowly added more gear as I could afford it and better cameras and things. But the point is you can be, thinking more technically and executing more and more technically. So 
the end goal is to have something as an artist, as a photographer, that's not very easy to replicate. And if you are hard to replicate, you're more likely to be asked to produce that again and again, because there aren't a hundred thousand other people that can do exactly what you did. So there's a lot of great photographers that can compose, but they might use only daylight or they're, you know, they're, they're just reacting to, they're only able to use the light that's provided indoors or outdoors. They're not able to shape and control light. So the more as a young photographer, you can move towards controlling light and having full, full command of, of how you want light and how to direct light into a scene or onto a person, the more success you'll have down the road. Doesn't mean every project's gonna be great. I certainly am not immune to um, making some of the wrong choices on lighting and certain things, but um, but you'll definitely increase your, your success rate by understanding light and to continue to move um, move and progress your craft forward. Yeah. Great advice, man. Brian, it is absolutely a pleasure to chat with you, man. I've got, I've got one last question for you. Um, let's see if I can stump you. If, if for some reason you could no longer tell stories, what would your last story look like for you? What would that last story that you'd want to go out on be? Yeah. And I was racking my brain today, Dan, and I, I, it's hard. Uh, I went from, um, I went immediately. I went back to my kids. I have three daughters, but I have one one daughter in particular, my youngest daughter, who has um, a lot of special needs. So there's something about her that's very special in her relationship to her other sisters and to our family and to even people she interacts with, uh, you know, in in her world at school and in the community, wherever she may be. And there's something intangible about it that I can't really describe. There's something very special about her. I'm her dad, I'm pretty biased, but um, there, there is a light there. So I don't, I don't know, uh, it would have to be around the impact that uh, her life has had uh, on our family, uh, her oldest sister, her middle sister, and vice versa, how my other daughters have helped her and engaged with her. So it's a special, unique family dynamic. And, uh, you know, maybe that's something I could focus on as a last story, but it would be a very personal one. It wouldn't be one for uh, an ad agency in New York. You know, I would rather, <laughs> I would rather be it about uh, something for uh, the legacy for our tight knit little family. Beautiful. Very cool, man. I appreciate your time tonight, my friend. Uh, where is the best place people can go find Brian Kelly's photos? Well, the most comprehensive, to see the most of what I do, you can go to my website at um, briankellyphoto.net. And that's B-R-I-A-N and that's K-E-L-L-Y photo.net. Or you can find me on Instagram and Twitter. And it's just at Brian Kelly photo. Pretty easy. But, awesome. Uh, yeah, I'm pretty pretty religious about feeding Instagram and Facebook and my website's always current. So you can always see what I've been up to recently. Yeah. You're, you're very good for, for a lot of marketers and, and entrepreneurs who don't market their own marketing and you, you blow it away. So. <laughs> well, thank you. Keep it up. <laughs> the, sometimes too much time on it, but it's the, you know, when you're a single, you know, you're an entrepreneur and a small business owner like I am, there's no one else is going to do it for you. So <laughs> amen to that. Right. Cool, man. Well, I appreciate your time today, sir. Thank you, Dan. I really appreciate the invitation and good luck to you this year in 2019 coming up. Yeah, thanks. All right. Once again, thank you so much, Brian Kelly, Brian Kelly Photography. Uh, you can connect with Brian at the links in the show notes. Uh, and if you're driving, maybe don't go to those show notes, but certainly make note to come back and visit those and, and, and go check out Brian's work. Simply fantastic photography. Good guy. Tell some great stories. A lot of fun to follow. And if you enjoyed this episode, please consider sharing it with someone you know who maybe is interested in storytelling or just interesting conversations. I love the guests that come on the show and I find them extremely interesting. Feel free to post it, of course, to social media, text someone you know or don't know, or just stop someone on the street and tell them about it. It'll not get awkward, I promise. If you just say, hey, have you heard? Anyway, it's a, it's a great way to spread the word of the Storytellers Network. And if you want to share your story with me, 
simply go to the storytellersnetwork.com, go to contact Dan on the contact page from that site, send me an email and let me know what you're thinking. Uh, and I appreciate that. We'll have a nice little conversation. Hey, until next time, here's to telling our stories and having those stories to tell. Cheers. Thank you.